than cyber torts. Torts are defined as a private civil legal action to obtain monetary damages from a legal injury to a person or their property. The plaintiff is the injured party and the defendant is called the tort feeser. Torts are classified as either intentional, unintentional, or negligence, or strict liability. Damages include compensatory or actual damages that attempt to put the plaintiff in the position he would have been in if the tort had not occurred, special or quantifiable damages such as lost wages or medical bills, general or non-monetary losses such as pain and suffering, and punitive damages which to attempt to punish the wrongdoer. These are typically only available in the intentional torts. Here are some of the intentional torts against persons. We'll go into these in more detail. Assault and or battery, false imprisonment, infliction of emotional distress, defamation, invasion of the right to privacy, fraudulent misrepresentation, abusive or frivolous litigation, or wrongful interference with a contract or business relationship. Assault is the reasonable apprehension or fear of immediate contact. It's not the actual contact. Battery is the actual contact. It could be a completed assault or an offensive, con offensive contact that occurs without an assault. So you can have assault and battery or assault or battery. Um, while it is an intentional tort, no motive is necessary and the plaintiff can be compensated for emotional harm. Defenses to assault and battery include consent, self-defense and others, and defense of property. So for example, boxing would be consensual. Defending oneself in a fight or defending someone else would be a defense, as well as defending one's property. False imprisonment is the intentional confinement or restraint without justification. Uh, in the business world, there are retail fraud statutes that allow a merchant to detain a suspected shoplifter as long as there is probable cause. To see an example of false imprisonment, see case 4.1. Intentional infliction of emotional distress requires extreme and outrageous conduct caused by the defendant and in some courts physical symptoms. Defamation is another intentional tort. It requires publication of a false statement that harms somebody's good reputation. Publication occurs when a third party hears or sees a statement. An individual who republishes uh, a defamatory statement may also have liability. As I said, the statement has to be false, oral or written assertions of fact, but not opinion. Opinion is not uh, defamation. It's free speech and generally not actionable. Slander is oral defamation and libel is written defamation. Statements made on the internet may be libel. Damages for libel are presumed as a matter of law. In other words, a plaintiff need not prove she was actually injured uh, because the libel statement is permanent and continues to harm even after the statement's made. In the case of oral defamation or slander, a plaintiff needs to show special damages or that there was actual um, some type of loss and the reason for this is that slander is temporary. Defenses include that the person is a public figure and the plaintiff needs to show that the statement was made with actual malice. In other words, the statement was made with knowledge of its falsity or reckless disregard for the truth. Truth is an absolute defense to defamation. Remember it requires a false statement or that the um, person who made the statement was privileged absolutely through some type of judicial or legislative proceeding or a qualified uh, privilege or immunity that, because the statement was made in good faith and limited. Invasion of the right to privacy um, is a tort that is in place because a person has a right to their solitude. A breach of that duty is a tort. Types of invasion of privacy, including intruding on someone's private affairs or seclusion, portraying them in a false light, publicly disclosing private facts, for example, maybe medical records, or appropriation of identity, kind of the civil side of identity theft. 
fraud or fraudulent misrepresentation occurs when someone intentionally deceives someone else, causes them to believe something to be true that's not. It requires a knowing misrepresentation of fact, not opinion, an intent to induce that innocent party to rely. They, in fact, justifiably rely, and that reliance causes them uh, harm or damages. Contrast that from puffery or statements of opinion. So if I went in to buy a used car and somebody said, this is the best used car ever, that's not really a rep misrepresentation of fact. That's just opinion and shouldn't be actionable. Another tort is abusive or frivolous litigation. Uh, this occurs if someone filed suit based on a malicious claim or without having legitimate reason, then they lose the lawsuit. Uh, they could be sued for malicious prosecution, and the other party could recover the cost of the suit, and in some states, even lost profits. There's also wrongful interference with a contract or business relationship. Uh, if it's a contract, it has to be valid and enforceable. A third party knows about that contract, and they intentionally cause the party to breach the original contract. But even if there's not a contract, um, there could be intentional interference with the business relationship. To prevail, the plaintiff must show the defendant targeted only that plaintiff's customers and product. And um, under defenses, one defense would be that uh, rather than intentional interference, that it's bona fide competitive behavior. There's trespass to land or personal property. Uh, if it's trespass to land, actual damages or harm is not required to prove trespass, and defense is that it was warranted or that the trespasser had permission or a license. Trespass to personal property is the kind of like the civil side of theft. It's wrongfully taking or harming or interfering with an exclusive right of use of personal property of another. Another word for personal property is chattel. Conversion is the wrongful taking or retaining possession of personal property and placing in the service of another. Good intentions aren't a defense, and usually you'll see uh, this occur with trespass to personal property. So sometimes somebody will take something that's a trespass and then converting it to their use or someone else's use is the conversion. Other times they might actually have permission to have it, but then they convert it or wrongfully uh, retain it. can also disparage somebody's title or the quality of their product. These are economically injurious falsehoods made about another's property or product. If it's about um, product, it's typically slander of title. If it's about uh, land or some property, um, it's slander of title. Unintentional torts or negligence. Negligence occurs when a plaintiff is legally injured due to a defendant's failure to live up to a reasonable standard of care, causing a foreseeable risk of injury. The questions you need to ask, there are four parts or four elements to negligence. Was there a duty? Did the duty get breached? Did the plaintiff suffer a legal injury? And did the defendant's breach of duty cause the plaintiff's injury. In other words, duty, breach, causation, and harm. Let's look at the uh, duty of care and a breach of that duty of care. It's a reasonable person standard. A duty is based on a reasonable person standard, which means how should a reasonable person have acted under the circumstances. Maybe uh, a landowner in that case, um, a landowner owes a duty to business invitees, somebody they invite into their business to warn them of risk and keep common areas safe. The only exception is if that risk is obvious. Uh, professionals owe a higher duty of care. So for example, attorneys, CPAs, doctors owe the same duty that other attorneys, CPAs, or doctors would owe to their clients. Causation is the next element. Uh, to hold a defendant liable, a plaintiff must um, show that the tortious act was both the actual and proximate cause of the injury. Causation of fact means but for, but for the defendant's injury, the injury or act, the injury would not have occurred. And proximate cause, the defendant's act created a reasonable risk of injury to the plaintiff. Plaintiff must suffer a legally recognizable injury. 
So if one's feelings were hurt, that's probably not sufficient. If the law recognizes it as an injury, then it would be. Not all injuries can be compensated. Um, sometimes there's no way to quantify it, or uh, as I mentioned, you know, hurt feelings or something like that. Compensatory damages are the norm. Uh, as I said earlier, punitive damages are usually only awarded if it's an intentional tort. Defenses to torts, superseding cause, in other words, some other event that's unforeseeable actually causes the injury. Uh, and contributory and comparative negligence. Uh, contributory negligence is rare, and basically it says the plaintiff won't recover if it can be shown that the plaintiff was at fault. Comparative negligence, which is more common, uh, the court would compare the degree of negligence of both parties, and as long as the plaintiff is less than 50% at fault, uh, they could recover a pro rata share of the verdict. In other words, let's say that the plaintiff was 20% at fault, their recovery would be reduced by that 20%. If it was more than 50%, then they wouldn't be able to recover. Some special negligence doctrines and statute raise ipsa loquitur, means the thing speaks for itself, even though we may not have direct evidence that it was negligence, it just doesn't occur without it. Negligence per se means uh, on its face, so there's an actual statute that says if it's violated that would be considered negligence, and the defendant um, broke that statute or law, the pla plaintiff is in that class to be protected, and that statute is designed to prevent the injury to the plaintiff. Danger invites rescue, in other words a situation is presented which causes somebody to go uh, and they're harmed. And other special negligence statutes like the Dram Shop Acts, which relates to alcohol liability, and the Good Samaritan statutes, which basically allow uh, somebody to act in capacity of a Good Samaritan and their liability be limited if they cause harm. Strict liability doesn't require fault. It's absolute liability. Uh, usually involves some kind of a normally dangerous activity. Uh, other ex applications would be uh, product liability. Basically, if there's a statute that says a manufacturer or seller uh, harms somebody with a defective product and they have liability, then they're absolutely liable. Another example of this would, a strict liability would be some statute that prevents somebody from having harmful animals, wild animals, or, you know, for example, pit bulls, if the statute uh, lists them. Cyber torts, basically all the same torts we talked about committed on the internet. Uh, one of the challenges can be identifying who the real author is. Um, another issue is whether the ISP or the internet service provider can have liability. And there have been a number of laws that attempt to limit the uh, service provider's liability because they're providing the service, not actually um, aware of everything that's happened. Uh, they may be uh, forced to reveal identifying information in some cases. And spam has been a big issue. Uh, there have been another uh, of, of federal laws um, to protect from spam um, or to protect uh, a 